In distant northern latitudes, monuments of the Stone Age are speaking a silent language of circles, alignments, and spaces. They tell us about their builders, and to some degree about the cultures of succeeding times. The spectacle of a standing stone or burial mound captures the imagination with its sense of scale and permanence. In this landscape of cycles and symbols, one monument has stood out across the ages, and today it has many stories to tell. Who were the authors of this monumental landscape? And how long ago did they live? How did their achievements fit into the rest of prehistory around the globe? Our understanding of Neolithic life has covered much ground since its antiquarian beginnings in the 18th century. Traditional theories about technological diffusion focused around the Mediterranean. Even today, popular conceptions of early civilization center around the great river valleys, such as the Nile, Tigris, Euphrates, or the Indus and with good reason. The latest research suggests that the first proto-farmers developed independently across several locations in Southwest Asia over 10,000 years ago. One of the earliest known writing systems was developed in Mesopotamia in the fourth millennium BC. And who could forget the pyramids of Egypt, with Djoser's proto-pyramid having been constructed at approximately 2750 BC? If, as explorers into the past, we pause at this date, and move away from these popularly regarded centers of ancient civilization, what might we expect to find as we move further and further away? Moving northwards, we encounter the Neolithic cultures of Europe on the eve of the Chalcolithic, or Copper Age. Although Atze the Iceman, who carried both a copper axe and a flint knife, has already lain frozen in the Alps for 500 years. Northern and Western Europe are well under the sway of megalithic cultures, the circular ditches of Stonehenge are already some centuries old, but its iconic trilithrons have yet to be raised. At last, our journey is done, as we descend on a group of islands called the Orkneys. By this time, this archipelago of some 40 islands has already been inhabited by a man for 4,000 years. I am a senior in anthropology at UC Berkeley, writing a thesis on Maze Howe, a Neolithic tomb in Orkney which I got the chance to visit in 2007. What follows is a brief account of what I found. Orkney's past. Archaeologists hope to unlock some of the secrets of the people who lived here over 5,000 years ago. This BBC news feed introduces finds at a nearby archaeological dig. Called the Ness of Brodger, I joined the team as a volunteer excavator and met the project leader, Nick Card, who was very knowledgeable about Maze Howe and related archaeology. Obviously, the way that all these monuments were viewed throughout time changed. But I think, you know, but you've got to think that, you know, all through the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, the Ring of Rodka, the Stone, mm -hmm. the Stoness, Mesa, it would have all been, you know, very prominent features in the landscape. Yeah. And you kind of wonder, how did these later prehistoric people view these earlier things? At a previous dig in mainland Scotland, I talked with archaeologist John T. Trigg, who teaches a class on British prehistory at the University of Liverpool. Well, one thing we do know about uh, about the Neolithic and the Bronze Age throughout Britain is that, there, that, that we have a series of complex interrelated ritual landscapes. And these are landscapes where you have a, a combination of monuments which are with, within that same landscape and which are uh, forming an integral part of the Neolithic way of life and, of course, of death.
Mm. Mays have, of course, you know, it, 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 it occupies an important part of, you know, it, it is the most prominent monument within Orkney's landscape of the Neolithic period. So from that point of view, it is obviously incredibly important, but it only forms one part of an interlocking landscape. And one of the things we have to remember is that, uh, it, it is that we, within the Neolithic period, we seem to be dealing with a complex series of rituals associated with ancestor worship. There's still actually no dates for Maze Howe itself. Um, there are some dates that came from the, the ditch that seems to surround it. And Maze Howe is built on this big clay platform so mm -hmm. right by a ditch. Right. And when Colin Richards excavated the, uh, the remains of the wall surrounding it, at the early 1990s. I think he did get some dates, but there's nothing to really associate that directly with the, the, the mound itself mm -hmm. and the chamber. So we're, it's, it's presently dated to around about somewhere, say 2500 BC. As soon as I was told by the historic Scotland tour guide that cameras and flash photography were not allowed inside Maze Howe, I knew it was going to be difficult to convey the experience of the tomb's interior in my film. To quote a passage from J.L. Davidson and A.S. Henshaw's The Chambered Cairns of Orkney, Maze Howe conforms to the tradition of tomb building which has been described in having an undivided chamber, off which is a symmetrical arrangement of three cells, all enclosed within a cairn core. It is the scale of its conception, the refinement of its design, and the quality of its masonry which makes Maze Howe one of the outstanding architectural achievements of prehistoric Western Europe. But the tomb of Maze Howe would receive yet another distinction some 4,000 years after it was built, when Vikings broke into the mound and left one of the largest collections of Viking runes chiseled into the walls. So there's a great disparity and a great variance within the runes which are carved within uh, within Maze Howe, and as we touched upon last time, some of them are, are quite crude um, and quite um, quite salacious. But there are others which are more poetical, if you like, which 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 are which are, which are historical, and including one section which does record actually the reasons why they the, the Vikings entered this 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 you know this this chamber. So it does seem to me that there's a certain amount of literacy. These runes fascinated me. Were they only found at Maze Howe, or had the Vikings treated other monuments as their carving slates? With runes on the brain, I went on a hike to visit a chambered cairn where cameras would be allowed inside. I chose Whiteford Cairn, with no idea what to expect. The cairn is situated about halfway up the steep western slope of Whiteford Hill. I found the interior of Whiteford Cairn to be cramped and soggy. I can now fully appreciate the precision and luxury of the inner chambers of Maze Howe. Persisting in my search, I discovered that Whiteford Cairn was filled with 19th century graffiti. I thought that was all, until... It's all modern, probably 19th century. Wait. Look. Twig runes, I was thinking. Were my eyes playing tricks on me? Here were a couple of what looked like the cryptographic types of 